All right. Today is Sunday, November 5th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. Now folks, I got a good one for you tonight. A happy daylight savings, whatever. Uh, we gained an hour, but it gets darker sooner. So I think this whole daylight saving bullshit is just uh, propaganda by big pharmaceutical companies to keep us hooked up on these depression drugs. But anyways, you know, last week we were talking about every rebound attempt in the stock market decline fails. And we see bond yields going higher and higher and higher. And we were all afraid about the geopolitics. What's going to happen in the Middle East? And the expectations were for the worst, that the market might collapse. And what do you know, this week, uh, we conclude by this headline right here. The best week for the year so far. Well, how the hell did that happen? Well, for one thing, it did not help that Jim Cramer became bearish all of a sudden. And number two, of course, you sold your stocks last week. You got afraid and you sold. And next thing you know, we have the best week. For the year so far and all i got to say is next time let us know but folks in all seriousness here why did the stock market experience the best week for the year so far notice the major drop that we got this week in the 10-year treasury yield we know that the main catalyst for the declines in the stock market since the month of july is the rise in bond yields so when we get a week where bond yields drop big we see the opposite reaction and understand this why would bond yields go down the answer is the dip in bonds were bought so bond prices went higher yields went down we'll explain why we'll entertain the theories to figure out whether this is sustainable or not of course the main argument would be well we got to five percent in the 10-year yield that seems to be a great deal and a lot of folks bought bonds at that point to lock in the five percent it's the best deal in town of course not as good as uh if you find the sugar daddy and uh you get pregnant, then you got a bond for 18 years, and it pays you about a thousand percent. Ask Al Pacino. Dude, gotta pay $30,000 a month. Uh, and for what? Because she got a great ass. But folks, we know that this is not the main reason. It's not the 5% that folks feel that, oh, that's so attractive. We saw a massive tsunami of buying bonds. That's not it. The argument actually goes, oh, did you watch the FOMC? Did you watch Jerome Powell last Wednesday? Well, he announced a pause. And now that we have a pause in interest rate hikes, boom, it's over. We're on for the races. Problem is, we have seen this headline over and over and over and over again. September 13th, 2023, S&P 500 ends higher as CPI data cements bets for Fed pause. We can go all the way back to May 26, 22. Stocks close firmly higher on Fed minutes pause hint. We've been recycling the same reason, the same excuse for any pop, any rally to say, oh, this is because this time around the pause is for real. The next thing you know, the Fed keeps raising rates. Now, we said repeatedly in this program that the Fed is not in charge. Inflation is. The Fed will do whatever inflation feeds them. If inflation comes back, they're going to have to hike more. And we know that the inflation problem in this economy is not over yet. We all read the headlines on social media that uh, it now costs $18 for a Big Mac in California. If I'm going to pay 18 bucks for a Big Mac, it better come with a toy at least. That's inflation, ladies and gentlemen. It's not going down. It's going in the wrong direction. But hey, maybe the market listened to Jerome Powell and uh, all what they heard is we're done with interest rate hikes. This is going to be a pause, but uh, the pause is not really that incentive for a major stock market rally. I think the market read it as, oh, cuts are coming next. When we will look at the surveys, 49% of responders say that the next move by the Fed will be a cut. Matter of fact, in the aftermath of the FOMC, we see that expectations of rate cuts are surging higher. Now, in reality, not uh, wishful thinking land, did Mr. Powell of the Federal Reserve in the last FOMC announce that uh, He's pausing and it's done. He's shutting the door on any new interest rate hikes and he's opening the door for rate cuts. Let's hear Jerome Powell in his own words. I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I want to just accept anybody's characterization of it. I'll, I'll tell you how we're doing this. So <clears throat> we're going meeting by meeting. We're asking ourselves whether we've achieved a stance of policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2% over time. That's the question we're asking. We're looking at the full range of economic data, including financial conditions and all of those things that we look at. And then we're we're you know, we, we've 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 come very far with this rate hiking cycle, very far. And you saw the spread at, in, at the September meeting of, you know, it's a relatively small spread of people think one or two 
additional hikes. So you're close to the to the end of the cycle. That's that was an impression as of a belief as of September. It's not a promise or a plan of the future. And so we're going into these meetings one by one. We're looking at the data. As for the committee, we are committed to achieving a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2 percent over time. And we're not confident yet that we have achieved such a stance. So is so, it right to think of that as a, a hiking bias is still in the committee here? We haven't used that term, but y y it's fair to say that's the question we're asking is should we hike more? So it's uh, it's the fact is the committee is not thinking about rate cuts right now at all. We're not talking about rate cuts. So we know that the narrative by the media that, oh, this pop is due to the Fed pausing and we're done with interest rate hikes. We know that this narrative is for Gazy, but the end impact is the same. We know that the stock market has three enemies right now. Bond yields, the dollar, and the VIX going higher. If all three going higher, we see big flush downs in the market. This week, we have seen all three going down big. We saw the best week in equities so far this year. Let's explore what moves each indicator here, and maybe we've done some progress. Let's see. When we look at bond yields, why have bond yields been moving higher as of late? We can talk about the supply issues and the reckless fiscal policy. So we see the response by Treasury Secretary Yellen of issuing more and more and more bonds to fund the reckless policies and to fund the foreign wars and the deficit. Now we know that the Fed been raising rates and they assume the position of fire for longer. And they have made it clear that they're not going to ease until they see a clear path toward the inflation at 2%. Then we have the issue of the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan is seeing Japanese bond yields moving higher. So we see the Bank of Japan dumping U.S. bonds. So prices go down, yields go higher. To use that cash to buy Japanese bonds. And this has been adding the fuel to the fire in the rise in bond yields and the drop in the equities market. This week, the market assumes, at least appears to be, that one catalyst, one tailwind for bond yields to go higher is no longer here, which is the Fed is out of the picture. Even though we just explained to you by Jerome Powell's own words that the Fed is not out of the picture. The man said clearly that if it takes one rate hike and inflation merits that we add another rate hike, we'll do that. And we're not even thinking about rate cuts right now. Furthermore, we said it's all in the hands of inflation, not the Fed. And the recent economic data that we got, at least from the hot side of the economy, the employment cost index this week came out higher than expectations. When we look at home prices, according to the Case Chiller Index, they went higher for the sixth month in a row. So inflation is still here. How could we assume that the Fed is out of the picture? How could we assume that we have a peak in interest rates? Even uh, lead banker Jamie Dimon says that he suspects the Fed is not done with interest rate hikes just hours after Powell hit the pause again. So the top banker in the country says, yeah, we're going to see more Fed action and rates are going higher. Even according to the same survey, where responders say that uh, perhaps the next step is rate cuts, 48.8% say that yields will go higher from this point on, but not higher than 5.5%. So the path is still for higher rates. Yet for now, we play what the market is assuming. We'll roll with it, no problem here. If the market wants to assume that the Fed and Jerome Powell are out of the picture and we have peak interest rates on bond yields, sure. We'll play that game. What about the dollar, though? We know that the Dixie have been going higher because other central banks, namely the ECB and the Bank of Japan, haven't been restrictive with the monetary policy. And therefore, this allows the euro and the yen to go down and for the dollar to appreciate in value. Number two, we know that because of inflation, we see quantitative easing, meaning reducing the money supply. If you're going to reduce the supply of dollars, the value is going to go higher. This week, we have seen that the dollar went down. Have we resolved the inflation problem? Are other central banks, mainly the ACB in the back of Japan, raising rates once again or fluffing up the value of the yen? We haven't seen any of these actions yet. So is the drop in the dollar this week based on fundamental reasons or is it based on technical and other reasons? Think about that for a minute here. Now, we know when we talk about the VIX, it's been dead. It hasn't been moving higher despite the fact that we have bond yields and the dollar going higher. We saw signs of life in the VIX the moment we began becoming concerned about the geopolitics and the war in the Middle East. And every time we head into a weekend with lack of certainty of what's going to happen in the Middle East and whether the war is going to expand or not, we see the VIX moving higher. But this week, we have seen the VIX being solved. So have we resolved the Middle East war and the problem on the geopolitics? 
political side? The answer is not really. But if you game these scenarios that we have done in last weekend's video, we talked about the low risk scenario and we are still in the low risk scenario. I understand that the war is a tragedy. You all see the pictures and it's extremely painful for anybody to see. But from the market perspective, it's not going to be concerned unless we have an expansion of the war where we see the prices of commodities increasing, namely oil. And there was a lot of fear that perhaps on the northern borders of Israel, we will see another front being opened in an expandable way by the involvement of Hezbollah. Well, we got the speech on Friday and it was not a declaration of war as I anticipated, but it kept the possibilities open for an escalation or even war. And this will keep the VIX alive. It could come back the moment we see things escalating again. And for now, according to the IDF, the operation is limited to the northern part. It's not a full invasion yet. So for now, the market looks at this as this is the low risk scenario. We haven't moved to the mid risk scenario and therefore maybe we don't need the VIX anymore. Maybe we don't need the puts anymore. Now, you and me can disagree with the market decisions, but at the end of the day, the market looked at the facts and decided that we are not moving from low risk to high risk. So I'm going to unwind some of these uh, hedges uh, in terms of puts and betting for downside coming to the market based on the geopolitics alone. And therefore, we know why the VIX went down this week. But what about bond yields and the dollar? If the Fed didn't really close the door for more rate hikes, did not open the door for rate cuts and the inflation problem is not resolved, is it really the real reason behind the short covering that we have seen in bonds this week, which pushed bond yields down big and the algorithms in the stock market reacted by buying equities? I would say absolutely not. And the risk for bond yields to go higher again is extremely high. And therefore, we go back uh, to a couple of weeks ago when we read the headlines that investor Snake Bill Ackman covered his short bet on the 30-year bond. And we saw immediately that the 30-year bond moved higher while yields went down. And then we got the news midweek that short sellers who made a fortune in the third quarter are beginning to close their bets, meaning covering their shorts. And this is the data before the FOMC. The total short interest in U.S. and Canadian stocks dropped by nearly $66 billion at the end of October to $871 billion, according to S3 partners. Short sellers have gotten an early Christmas present in the third quarter. From here, traders are not building up new positions as they don't want to lose what they've made already. This is the real reason behind the drop in bond yields this week, which triggered the best stock market rally this year so far. Short covering, booking profits from both bond and equities short sellers. Why would they do that though? Specifically in bonds, because when bonds are bought, because of short covering, we see that yields go down and the algorithms in equities immediately get triggered to do what? To buy equities. So yes, we have seen a lot of short covering heading into the FOMC. But after the FOMC, the last two days, major props happened because we have seen a lot of algorithmic buying and a lot of other factors, which we're going to talk about in a minute here. But we go back to the fundamental question here. Why did bond shorts cover this week? Do they see that uh, maybe the Fed is done and we're going to pause and we have achieved the Goldilocks scenario or we have achieved the soft landing and there's no need to bet against bonds anymore? Of course not. All what we have to hear is what Snake Bill Ackman said as a reasoning for closing his bond short. He is now worried about a slowing economy more than inflation. He sees a lot of risk to the economy and hence he's buying bonds a safety or at least not shorting them anymore. Gee, when we talked about the hot side of the economy, what is the icy side looks like? This week, we got the Chicago Business Barometer. This is the 14th straight month contraction. We got the ISM Manufacturing Index, which dropped to the lowest level since July. We got the Services PMI, and it showed a major slowdown at a five-month low. Consumer confidence slipped down from 104.3 to 102.6. This is again a five-month low. On Friday, we got the non-farm payrolls, and the headline reads, U.S. employers pulled back on hiring in October, adding 150,000 jobs in face of higher borrowing rates. And the revision Decisions for prior readings are stunning. We're shaving off 60, 70,000 jobs from prior readings. And we see the unemployment rate now ticking higher. 
And we know the moment the Fed raises rates and we see rates going higher for longer, as long as we've seen them so far, you're going to see some major damage in the economy. And usually the trouble begins when we see the unemployment rate moving higher and we see that the yield curve is re-steepening from inversion, which we see right now. And of course, we know that the much accurate and less manipulated household survey shows that employment collapsed by 348,000. This is the biggest drop since the thing shut down. In other words, when we revisit the question, why did the short sellers cover their bond shorts this week? The answer becomes they see a recession here. They see that this is the beginning of the recession. And maybe we have seen the peak in bond yields. Maybe we've seen the bottom in bond prices, but not for the good reasons, not for the Goldilocks bullshit, not for the soft landing crap. We're doing so for the wrong reasons, because the economy is now slipping into a recession. And would that be good for corporate earnings? Would that be good for stocks? Think about that for a minute here. While you do that, let's formulate the strategy for this week, because last week's strategy, and I issued this on Discord immediately after the FOMC on Wednesday, the 1st of November. The strategy was buying the SPY 420 puts with the expiration date of next week, meaning November 10th, and then buying the TNA 24 calls. The TNA is the three times bullish index for the small caps index, the IWM. And we picked the same expiration date, November 10th. And that way we got exposure to both sides. We anticipate a major move. So having this strategy is the equivalent of having, let's say, a straddle strategy, where you're not sure about the direction of the move, but we're sure about the size of the move. And we also said that uh, we got to close the puts on the Qs, Apple, NVIDIA, all of these names were showing technical improvement. The results, of course, the SPY 420 puts with the expiration date of next week is pretty much worthless right now. Uh, it could be a miracle this week where we see the SPY losing more than 15 points rapidly and we see the 420 puts of the SPY becoming in the money again. But that doesn't matter because the 24 TNA calls appreciated in value by over 7 hundred percent. In other words, if you put a thousand dollars on the SPY 420 puts, and then you put another thousand dollars on the TNA 24 calls, you might have lost the 1000 in the SPY 420 puts, but the winner bet on the TNA made you about $7,000. And I will look at this as a success. So what do we do here from this point now? We talked about this on Friday in the live stream that we we're done with the TNA calls because if you look at the IWM here, the chart looks really, really exhausted. It got a nice pop, closed the gap above, and now what? It's ready to pull back. So now we need a different strategy for this week. We know that the chart might have reached a ceiling here in the S&P 500 as we see a trend of lower highs and lower lows. On the other hand, the daily RSI is not really overbought. So do we have more room for this trend to move higher? In reverse, and we see higher highs and higher lows, or do we hold the trend and we see a lower high leading to a lower low? Now, recently, we have seen two examples of a rebound rally. Both of them failed. Both of them were not at extreme RSI readings on the daily chart. So we can pull back from here and reverse entirely. That is among the possibilities. Likewise, if we zoom in to an hourly chart of the SPY, the S&P 500 index, you look at the RSI, and we can go back a little over a year ago, every time we have reached this extreme reading on the RSI, we have seen a pullback in the chart. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the most extreme reading in the RSI in about two years, which means if the odds are right, we are due for a pullback here. So what do we do? Here's the weekly strategy. Intraday overbought conditions on charts will offer an opportunity to hedge long positions accumulated recently. So if you happen to be one of the lucky ones who got into equities on the long side right after the FOMC and you caught Thursday and Friday's rallies, later in the day on Friday, you should have hedged here. You should have bought, for example, calls on the inverse index for the SPY or for the Qs or for the IWM or maybe buy puts on the IWM. Do something the hedge the long position accumulated recently. For shorts, on the other hand, it would be an opportunity to reduce losses on short positions. For traders, swing traders, this will be a rewarding opportunity for pullback trades. So the strategy as we enter the week is, you gotta have some short exposure at this point with anticipation of a pullback not a failure of the rebound. The shorts get an opportunity to reduce their losses if the puts are way out of the money and hold the cash for the next trade. For those who went long this week, 
You don't want to lose your gains, you gotta have some hedges here. As the odds say, they were due for a pullback, and it could be a big one. Then charts will find support after hourly charts are fixed. The key to finding support is the participation of investors to buy the dip, since we know that the steps in a bottoming rally are number one. We see short covering. Well, we've seen that already. When the shorts cover, charts begin to climb above moving averages. That's gonna trigger quant funds to buy automatically. So now we have two buyers in a rebound rally. And then comes the market market maker. As a lot of calls now get in the money, the market maker has to scramble and hedge all of a sudden. How do they do that? By buying equities. So now we have three buyers, three forces moving equities higher with no seller, with no resistance at all. And we see what we've seen recently. Major, major rally in a short amount of time. Most of you were not even able to get in because it happened in two days. So what do you do now? Do you chase the pop right here? That's a fool's errand because the odds are for a pullback. Therefore, we are getting a pullback. In this pullback, the test would be, will retail investors and the institutions alike would they hop in? Because we know that the institutionals are actually have the lowest exposure right now. They've missed the pop. They're not going to chase it at this point. They're waiting for a pullback. If the pullback happens, would they put their money where their mouth is and buy the dip? Will you do the same? And if we all do the same, and we get a rebound, so far so good. If dip buying is successful, we must confirm that by the charts of bond yields and the dollar index. We need to see that these two charts are trending down, not up, because the key to keeping the October lows in the stock market is the 10-year yield not going back to 5%. If it goes back to 5%, the October lows will open like a floodgate. So we have to have a confirmation here by both bond yields and the dollar. If confirmed, then we should concentrate on going long small caps because these are the most oversold the more likely to be covered by shorts and of course dollar and yield sensitive stacks dollar sensitive stacks that could be metals of course yield sensitive stacks could be dividend paying stacks or certain risk on stacks within the technology sector however if finding support fails you must enter short positions with the assumption that the pattern of lower highs and lower lows on the charts we're talking about the daily chart of the indices spy q's iwm we will assume that this pattern will persist. In other words, we're going to be shorting looking for a lower low. And of course, the confirmation would be, what are bond yields doing? Are they heading back to 5%? Okay, got a confirmation to be short now. Is the dollar rebounding and moving higher again? Another confirmation. So this is going to be the strategy for this week. We get a pullback, and then we have a lot of decisions to make. So stay tuned, folks. But for now, I want to keep it short and sweet here and connect the conversation with the charts right away and skip the other stuff in the interest of time. So let's do some charts here and then wrap it up. We begin with SPY. We have a lot of charts. This is why we're skipping, folks. We begin with SPY and hourly chart. What do we see here? On the hourly chart, we see that uh, no matter what destination you gained as the top, for this rebound, be it filling the gap at around 423 or 420 or 430 or 435. It doesn't matter what target you had. It just kept going higher and higher and higher. You got three forces buying now, shorts, quants, and the market maker. And there is no seller here. And hence, we see the explosive rally. But now look at the RSI. It became really, really overbought. In other words, a pullback is guaranteed here. The targets could vary from 430, 426, 422 even. We have no idea. This is why we're going to look for support and see how the chart behaves at support. We'll identify more targets here for you. We use the daily chart. This is the SPY. We know right now that the chart is above the 20 days moving average in white and the 50 in blue. Bullish, not bearish. Still below the 100, but we're seeing some progress here. And the moment we have a closing above the 20, we see quant funds buying. So you see the acceleration of the buying volume here leading to an explosive short covering rally. What we also know is we have a pattern of lower highs and lower lows. And for now, the assumption should be that we're going to form a lower high and move down to lower lows until what? Until the prior high sitting at 438.14 is taken out. And if we go down from here in a pullback, as we anticipate, we're going to have gap support number one. As you can see, we're going to have gap support number two. A pullback even all the way down to filling gap support number two will still be risk to the upside, not the downside, because we could see a lot of the fluff being taken out. And then the dip buyers will show up at gap support number two out of the fear of missing out. So we could see the formation of a lower high, but a higher low. So you're not going to go short again until we see gap support number two being violated. Then we got a shorting signal. Likewise, if we clean up the chart here, we know that we have been in an uptrend since the breakout in the month of June. 
thank you nvidia of course then came the month of july we see the july top which we called in this program accurately and since then we have seen a downward trend with lower highs we know that in uh, this kind of a trend let's call it a bearish trend the rebounds are extreme we have seen two at least so far before the one that we got recently and the gains ranged from four to five percent the recent rebound is worth about six and a half percent so it's not out of the ordinary and if we go back to 22 for example in the bear market and the downtrend of 22 the rebounds were extreme ranging from eight percent eleven percent even eighteen percent but then the chart pulled back and the reason is in a bear trend we see all the time we see profit taking by the shorts they cover their shorts then we see the quant funds being triggered the market maker and then the retail mom and pops the institutional investors are not following up we see these bear market rallies failing if we move on to the weekly chart for the spx the cash index for the s p 500 what do we see here on the weekly chart we see that we're still below the 20 week moving average we are still forming a pattern of lower highs despite the impressive gains this week we also know that the momentum remains bearish. If you look at the MACD indicator, it remains bearish. If you look at the Vortex indicator, the bearish momentum remains the dominant force until that's changed. And we'll know that it's going to be changed once we see this sloping line of resistance being broken and the chart takes over the 20 weeks moving average. Then we'll know for sure that higher we go. If we move on to the monthly chart though, what do we see here? The month is still young. But so far, did we change anything by this pop? The answer is absolutely not. Look at the MACD indicator. We still have a pattern of a lower high. We have still not taken out the top of last month trading range. So we know for now that all in all, in the larger charts, the most important charts, the risk is to the downside. That we have top. We're going to lose momentum and go down from this point on. If we look at the E-mini futures daily chart, what do we see here? We caught support from what we talked about in last week's video. We talked about the support zone. We got support from that zone and we initiated a massive rally that got us above 4,300. Not only that, but we got almost to 4,384 and a half and we stopped short of that. Now, is this bullish or bearish? absolutely bullish and the momentum indicators prove that here's the problem though if we clean up the chart we still have a pattern of lower highs and lower lows and until that is reversed we must assume that this one will fail and form a lower high leading to a lower low how about the cues and hourly chart what do we see here again an impulsive rally defying all expectations heading into the week I anticipated a rebound, maybe get us all the way to 357. But after that, what happened on Thursday and Friday defies all expectations. We can see that we're trading above 367, which is super bullish. Problem is, the hourly chart is becoming really, really overextended. So we know a pullback is coming. Will the pullback be too aggressive as to get us back to 357? Even if it does that, the bias will remain to the upside. Until what? Until we do more damage to the chart, but we see bond yields moving higher to challenge 5% again. But for now, we're looking for a pullback. We'll see how it's going to hold. Will 363 be the number? 360, 357, a little below. We have no idea, but we're waiting for it. How about the daily chart for the Qs? What do we see here? It is trading above the 20 days moving average, but below the 100 days. So we see that as resistance for now. Likewise, we know that we have a downward trend of lower highs. And the assumption for now should be that we're going to form a lower high and go down from this point on until proven otherwise. Until the chart trades above the 100 days moving average, forming a higher high. We also know that in the past, in a downward trend, we have seen counter trend rallies being really impressive. The last two produced gains ranging from six to seven and a half percent. The one we have right now is about seven and a half percent. It's not out of the ordinary. What's out of the ordinary, it happened too fast and nobody was able to get in. But if we go back in the chart to the year 22, in a downward trend, we see massive explosive counter trend rallies. That's not out of the ordinary, but the sustainability of these counter trend rallies rely on individual investors, institutional investors buying, not just buying because, oh, it's an oversold rebound. They buy with the intention of holding. Number two, we get a confirmation from whatever indicator that upset the stock market to begin with. If there is a reversal in this indicator, then we got a confirmation. But we see these bear rallies failing because we don't see a sustainable buying effort by investors, number one, and number two. Bond yields, of course, were upsetting the stock market at the time. When they dip, we see a counter trend rally. Then they come back again and they resume the main trend, which is downward, lower highs and lower lows.
If we look at the index, the NASDAQ 100 weekly chart, what do we see here? Last week, we talked about a bear flag. It played out. And this week, we see a reflex reaction. It got us above 15,000, which is bullish, not bearish. Here's the problem, though. The rebound is still short of making a higher high, as you can see the sloping line of resistance here, and it's still short of closing above the 20 weeks moving average. Nice rebound, but did it change anything? The answer is absolutely not, at least not yet. There is the potential for it. If we plug in the vortex indicator, for example, we can get a confirmation of the blue line moving above the red, meaning bullish momentum taking over. And this could be just one giant bull flag consolidation pattern. That is entirely possible. But for now, the risk remains to the downside absent for closing above the 20 weeks moving average. If we look at the monthly chart for the NDX, what do we see here? We know that we have a lower high pattern. We know that the momentum weakened dramatically. But is it over for any bullish scenario? The answer, of course not. This could be a gigantic cup and handle pattern. Would I bet on it right now? Of course not, until we take the highs. For now, the assumption is the lower high will be the predominant pattern, until proven otherwise. You look at the NASDAQ futures daily chart, what do we see here? We caught a rally this week and we closed above 15,000, bullish or bearish? The answer is bullish. But does it reverse the bearish overall pattern? The answer is not quite, at least not yet. We clean up the chart, we still have a pattern of lower highs and lower lows. The pattern will be broken once we trade above 15,468.75. If we look at the small caps index, the IWM, what do we see here? We talked about how attractive it looked last week, holding 162 and a half, and we could see a big rally. And this is why we picked the IWM as the number one pick on the long exposure. And it paid off. We got all the way to 175.45 almost. And now what? Is the chart overbought in the daily? Of course not. Problem is, if we zoom into the hourly chart, we are really overbought here. We have reached the resistance of 175.45. Expectations pull back. If it holds, it would be a viable opportunity because we'll make higher highs. And the reason is, even if we have a severe pullback here, let's say to closing the gap at 170 almost, 169-ish, then rebound, then this could be a one big cup and handle pattern. So we'll keep an eye on that. About the Dixie, the chart of the dollar, daily chart, what do we see here? We know that we have strong downward momentum. Problem is, we see it extended below the lower Bollinger Bands, from which before we have seen rebounds. What if the dollar rebounds big this week? That would be upsetting to the stock market. But then what? Suppose the dollar rebounds, equities pull back. What happens after that? Does the dollar continues to rally? In that case, we have to be short. If the dollar pulls back again, be confirmation that we should be buying the dip in equities. Weekly chart for the dollar, what does it say here? If we use Fibonacci's levels, it shows that we have lost an important support. But we're not at a reversal yet. We still have support below. And we have no confirmation that the dollar is done here. We do have a confirmation that the dollar is getting weaker. But that's all there is. So when we look at the old man gold, the daily chart, what do we do here? It appears that we have a pattern of consolidation of higher highs and higher lows, although the momentum on the daily chart is getting a little overextended. So breaking the pattern and then breaking 19 62 and a half would be a confirmation that gold is heading down. But if we look at the weekly chart here, what do we see? We see that the chart is bullish, maybe a little overextended here at the top of the Bollinger Bands. So sure, we're going to pull back Absolutely no problem here. But you look at the formation of the RSI, you look at the MACD giving us a confirmation of bullish momentum. So does the Vortex indicator. For now, the pullbacks in gold are viable. And remember this, maybe puts were taken off the table this week because we haven't seen a major escalation in the Middle East war, meaning more players joining the battlefield. We haven't seen that yet, so we saw a lot of these puts being taken off. But it doesn't mean that investors' posture, all in all, is risk on. Otherwise, we would have seen a massive pullback in gold, which again tells you that the retail mom and pop investors, a lot of the institutional side, are not really buying this rebound. They missed it. It happened too fast. But maybe they're not really interested in chasing it. And it could be a bad sign that once we pull back, these type of investors are not going to come back and buy the dip in equities. Why? Because they're sticking to gold. They did not say sell gold. In other words, part of the confirmation that the pullback in equities will be bought by dip buyers and will lead us higher can be confirmed by not just bond yields or the dollar, but also the chart of gold. If we see gold pulling back, then we know that money's coming out of gold and chasing the dip in equities. Otherwise, it could be a warning sign that if equities dip, the dip might lead to a sell-off, not a rebound. SLV Silver daily chart, what do we see here? 
holding above the 20 days moving average, but short of the 200 MA and short of 21.45. So for now, you stick with it. If we lose the 20 days moving average, then get out. If we look at UK oil, Brent oil, what do we see here? Bad news. Bear flag played out. Bad news number two. We are still below the 20 days moving average. Good news. We're above 85. We're holding that as support. So oil bulls are not without hope. But let's be honest here. It doesn't look pretty good. If this war remains limited and we continue to get bad economic data, slow down in jobs, maybe more layoff beginning to show up, then oil will go down. But look at the weekly chart for Brent. What do we see here? It is holding by a thread right now. It might lose the 20 weekly moving average for good, confirming that we have an inverse ABC pattern. You look at the weekly hour sign, negative divergence, you look at the Weekly MACD, the bullish momentum is about to lose steam here and become bearish. And the vortex indicator is also telling us that we have risk of oil turning bearish from being bullish since the month of July. And by the way, this support the stock market. So if you see oil going down, I think that's going to support the stock market. The problem is if oil goes down by a lot, if oil has a recession panic, that would not be good for equities. So if we look at the XLE here, which is energy stocks, the ETF for that, is it better now than the commodity? The answer is it won't make a difference. It is still below the 20 moving average. And if we see the price of crude going down, energy stocks will follow through. So for now, we're not a buyer of the XLE until we see it closing above the 20 days moving average. How about the USO, which tracks the commodity? Maybe looking a little better here. Holding on to the Fibonacci support. Holding on to a downward trending channel, but keeping the lows static. In other words, there is risk here that we could see a pop and a move higher in the USO. But losing this Fibonacci line will indicate that we have lower lows to come. And perhaps the bullish story in oil is over now. So it is at a critical line, critical level here. We need a move coming this week, a decisive one. And with the geopolitical risk remains intact, this move could be higher. I would not be surprised to see that. If we look at uh, refiners, on the other hand, which I see as more favorable right now, a lot of energy stacks, but we have to wait for confirmation. And the reason is we're flirting with the 20 days moving average. Got it on Thursday, lost it Friday. We need a conclusive move here. Are we going to be above or below? If the answer is above, then we should be buyers of names such as VLO and the refiners. But another thing we have to watch for is if oil prices go down, but the gasoline or bob futures move higher or hold static, then the margins for refiners will improve. So we need confirmations from the fundamentals and a confirmation from the technical side to say the VLO is a buy or not. If we look at the US two-year yield, what do we see here? It has broken a downward channel and it lost support at 4.874 basis points. So we know that at least for now, we're making lower lows. We have made perhaps a lower high. Yields are going down. Equities like it. Is it going to be going down for the wrong reasons or not? That's an important question. Another one. Is the market overreacting? The expectations of rate cuts when the Fed denied that? Are we see an inverse move next week? Perhaps. This is what I'll be watching for here. But more important than the two is the 10. And the 10 caught support from what we identified on Friday, 4.483 basis points. We got to that line pretty much to the penny. We caught a rebound. Now what happens? We know that we have a formation of a lower low, which means that we could see a rebound, but this rebound will form a lower high. That would be a confirmation to buy equities. In the meantime, the rebound could upset equities. And therefore, I reiterate that our outlook here for this week is pull back in equities, rebound in the dollar, rebounds in bond yields. And then if we see that bond yields here in the 10 year, forming a lower high and moving down again, Dixie moving down again, then the dip in equities will be bought and higher we go. So keep that in mind. If we look at the weekly chart for the 10 year, we see weakness, we see loss in momentum, really extremely strong momentum in the RSI and the MACD, but we haven't really broken the important line to say that the upward trend here on the weekly chart is over. So we still have risk to the upside in the 10 year yield. We cannot dismiss the risk right now, absent of a confirmation of a lower high. TLT daily chart what do we see here nice pop this week yields go down prices go higher but is it becoming a little too excessive here trading outside of the boundaries of the bollinger bands i would argue yes and therefore i see a pullback in the tlt and i see a rebound in bond yields and then we have to see what happens the reaction to that will determine whether we have a bottom in the tlt or not whether we should be buying the tlt or not and therefore for now if we look at yield sensitive sectors and etfs such as the xhp the home builders etf massive Massive rebound this week as we see bond yields going down. But we have now reached the top of the Bollinger Bands. 
if yields rebound as anticipated. We will see a sharp pullback here in the XHB. If the chart keeps the 20 days moving average, the dip could be viable. If it loses the 20 days moving average, forget about it, it was a trap, and down we go from here, as the weekly chart suggests, by the way. And on the hourly chart, look at this. We have two supports. Gap support number one, that could be a downside of about 2.5%. Gap support number two could be down or about 4.5%. But if we see the buyers showing up, we could still see a cup and handle formation. If we lose that support, the last gap support, and the 20 MA, then we got a problem. This was a trap. And down we go from here. If we look at the XLU utilities daily chart, what do we see here? Trading outside of the Bollinger Bands. So we're waiting for a pullback. Is the pullback viable or not? That depends on bond yields. But for now, the risk versus reward says you got to bet for a pullback here in the XLU. Likewise, a high dividend paying name, Verizon. When we look at the daily chart here, it appears really exhausted. The drop in bond yields was really good for this name. But now, since we filled the gap, are we due for a pullback? The answer is, I bet so. How about the volatility index, the VIX daily chart? What do we see here? Look at this. Massive drop this week so far. Forming a lower low, breaking the trend and losing 17 as support. And the question now becomes, is it over for the VIX? The short answer is, if you're going to look at it from a perspective of lower lows and lower highs, yeah, maybe it's over. But then you look at the four hours chart, if you zoom in, every time we got this extremely oversold in the chart, and it was only three times this year, including the one that we have right now. But in the prior two, we have seen sharp rallies in the VIX with a range of about 20%. And the question now becomes, since the VIX is really oversold and equities are really overbought in the hourly chart, will we see a rebound in the VIX? Will it be as big as 20%? Because if it does, then not. Uh, the rally in equities and the drop in the VIX was a trap. And now we're back in trend, above the trend line, above 17. And maybe we're going to go higher and challenge 20 again. So this is what I'm watching for. Will fixing the oversold conditions in the VIX and fixing the overbought conditions in equities be benign, leading to a mere pullback and a rebound in the VIX? Pullback in equities, meaning, and a rebound in the VIX. And then the VIX goes down. Equities find buyers and go higher, then no harm done. But what if they're not benign, though? What if we see the VIX surging higher by 20%? What if we see equities, the SPY, the Qs, dropping sharply by more than 2.5%, 3%? Then the action was a trap this week. But for now, we have no confirmation of that. We also have no confirmation in the weekly chart. That the VIX is now bearish. If you look at the Vortex indicator, if you look at the MACD indicator, they're all showing positive momentum. They happen to be lagging indicators, but we use them that way to be conservative before assuming that a trend is over. We need a lagging indicator here, not to make decisions until we have confirmations that these trends are indeed reversing. And for now, we have no confirmations of that happening. Big Kahuna, Apple, hourly chart, what do we see here? The report was not good. Stock drops by about 3.5% in the aftermarket session. But then comes the Fugazi jobs report pump and the drop in yields. And we see dip buyers, be it algorithmic programs, be it in actual investors, who cares? We saw Apple closing well above the lows, but not positive. So could this be the leading indicator that equities will go down next week? And as Apple goes, so will the market perhaps. We look at the daily chart here. What do we see? We're above the 20 days moving average. We're above the 200. So for now, this supports more upside for Apple. Problem is, we still have a trend of lower highs. And this supports lower prices in Apple. So we haven't solved the problem yet. And a loss of the 20 days moving average would be a confirmation to go short again. A pop above the sloping line of resistance and most importantly, forming a higher high would be a confirmation that you have to be long. If we look at the weekly chart for Apple, what do we see here? We see that the momentum remains bearish. If we look at the RSI, MACD, Vortex, doesn't matter. We know that we're below the 20 weeks moving average. And that's bearish, not bullish. But maybe forming a bullish wedge. We're about to have a breakthrough here and trade above the 20 weeks moving average. Problem is, we have seen such a pattern before, not so far ago. We have seen these pops before. Declines, short covering, big pops, and then they fade away. So for now, there's still a lot of risk to the downside here on the weekly chart. How about the daily chart for the souffle Tesla? We talked repeatedly how the chart is oversold, and you don't want to be the Johnny come lately and shorting when the chart is oversold. Now we get an oversold rebound. Got us above the 200 days moving average in blue, but we are short of the 20 days moving average. We'll keep an open mind here. If Tesla makes it above the 20 days moving average, so far so good, we're gonna go back to closing the gap. If the chart loses the 200 days moving average, then forget about it. We're going down to form lower lows. If we zoom in to the hourly chart of Tesla, maybe we have 
an inverse head and shoulder pattern right now. But the bears would argue that we have also a bear flag pattern. Expectations. Pull back in Tesla. Question is, will we find buyers? at 210? Will we find buyers at 205? Or will we just go down at 202 and a half and lose data support and then goodbye to the inverse and the shoulder? As to the weekly chart for the souffle, what do we see here? Above the 200 weeks moving average but below the 20, which is the most important one. We have a downward channel. We caught support from exactly the same place we're supposed to catch support from. Yet the momentum indicators, the MACD and the Vortex, still show that the predominant theme is bearish on the weekly and the most important chart. We can see a rebound in Tesla, and it can take us all the way to the top of the range here, and then come down. But what if we go down right away, and we lose this trading channel? Then we're going to have a flush down. How do we know that we're heading that way? Losing the 200 days weekly and daily moving averages. Double confirmation. We lose that. Goodbye, we have lower lows. The next support would be at around 163.91. How about NVIDIA? An hourly chart, what do we see here? After the chart pierced below 400, it caught a massive empathy rebound. Why do we say that? We know that we have bad news for NVIDIA, but because we got good news, or let's say good reactions, wasn't really a good report. We got a good reaction because of a lot of short covering in AMD and Qualcomm. We have seen NVIDIA moving higher in empathy, but now the chart is really, really overbought. So we're looking for a pullback. If the pullback takes us all the way down below 424.80, then understand that this was a trap. Lower we go. We're going to take 400 as support for sure. Rebound takes us all the way down to 424.80 or above. And then we catch a rebound, forget about it. Then we're going to see buyers and NVIDIA will move higher, perhaps to closing the gap at around 460. If we zoom out to the daily chart, what do we see here? The topping head and shoulder is still here. We are still below all of the important lines. But for now, the risk is if we pull back and we keep 424.80, the risk is this could be a formation of an ABC pattern. And the pullback is just a mere formation of the B leg in such a bullish formation. Therefore, losing 424.80 would be a confirmation that there is no ABC pattern. It was a trap and down we go from here. As to the weekly chart for NVIDIA, now we got a clear rejection, not last week, but the week before. We lost the 20 weeks moving average and we got a clean rejection, so we should have moved down. Why the rebound? Why recapturing the 20 weeks moving average? It makes me suspect that maybe it is indeed an empathy rebound. And we have seen that before. If you look back at the example of uh, 2022, lost the 20 weeks moving average, got rejected twice, then came back, broke above. Why would you do that when you already retested the 20 weeks moving average? It was a no-go and this was a false break. Now the question becomes, is the break that we got this week also a false break? We will know that once we lose the 20 weeks moving average. And the important number is 439.80. If we lose that, and most importantly close the week below that, and this is why I say that perhaps looking at 424.80 is more conservative and a better strategy. Than looking at the 20 weeks moving average. But a weekly closing below the 20 weeks moving average will be sufficient enough in my book that we're heading down. Last but not least, tulips, Bitcoin, daily chart. What do we see here? We talked about the triangular consolidation pattern. Got a breakout and the breakout came above. Now we're holding this line as support, forming what it appears to be a bear flag pattern. Like I said before, chasing Bitcoin right now is not advisable because you're chasing it pretty much as a Johnny come lately to the move. As we see the RSI reading overextended and the MACD moving from bullish momentum down to bearish. I'd rather wait for a pullback, see how it's going to hold, and if it holds pretty good, forming a higher low and doesn't challenge 31,000 as support, and we see a nice rebound after that. That would be the permission and the green light to go along Bitcoin with comfort. This is not a trap. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar this week? Monday, November 6, we have Governor Cook, and then we have the Federal Reserve Sluice Senior Loan Survey. Tuesday, November 7th, we have uh, the trade deficit. We have Vice Chair Barr speaking again along with Governor Waller, another zombie from the Fed. Then we have consumer credit. Wednesday the 8th, we have more Fed zombies, including the big dog himself, Chairman Pound. And he comes along with Governor Cook and Vice Chair Barr once again along with Vice Chair Jefferson. In the macro front, we get wholesale inventories. Thursday, November 9th, we have initial jobless claims and we have the remarks by Chairman Powell to the IMF. And lastly, Friday, November 10th, it's going to be a slow day in anticipation of the Veterans Day holiday. So the expectations are that Friday will be a shorter day. Traders will leave the desk pretty quickly in anticipation of the long holiday. Besides that, folks, I hope that the video was informative. And if it was, kindly press the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, and consider joining us as a member. 
this channel. But folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. Never hate your enemy. It affects your judgment.